being a SQL monkey is probably not going to cut it anymore when AI is a, is a better SQL monkey mm. than, than we are. The, the thing it's lacking is the executive skill and the, the memory, right? the long-term memory and the, and the business context that are, for now, private from the LLM and need to be squeezed into a context window for it to, to make sense and be useful. It's been kind of a learning journey because um, at first I was just like trying things and then it just like doesn't work. And I was like, man, this LLM thing, man, it's all hype, <laughs> like shit doesn't work. <laughs> and then it took me a while to realize, it's like, okay, I'm actually just really bad at prompting. Um, it's kind of like, like Googling back in the days, right? Like if you don't do the right keywords, the result is not like super great. So for you, right, like you're doing like eight to 10 prompts every day. Like, did you see that gradual like improvement in terms of uh, results for yourself? And like, how do, how do I get better at this? Like, I do want yeah. to get better. On Langchain, I think it's really interesting because like when I found it, I had the same thing. I like, I don't really understand <laughs> why this exists. Not because I, I just didn't understand the problem space. Then I got familiar with the problem space. I was like, oh yeah, this is like everything I need. This is super great. But right. then I started to try to use it. And then I was like, oh, this is, it does like kind of what I want it to do, <laughs> but then it not, but, but not exactly. And then I cannot use the, the methods that are here exactly in the way I want to use them. Welcome to the Software Misadventures podcast. We are your hosts, Ronak and Guan. As engineers, we are interested in not just the technologies, but the people and the stories behind them. So on this show, we try to scratch our own edge by sitting down with engineers, founders, and investors to chat about their path, lessons they have learned, and of course, the misadventures along the way. Welcome to the show, Max. Super excited to have you here. Well, excited to be on the show too, and excited to catch up with uh, the episodes you have so far too. So uh, <laughs> make sure to catch up on that. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so just getting right into it. So at the beginning of 2017, uh, you wrote this post called The Rise of the Data Engineer, which both helped define the role as well as bring more attention to it. Uh, so I was a data engineer, you know, when that came out and was like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, like this is what it's all about. But, in, but then at the end of the same year, you write a sequel to this called The Downfall of the Data Engineer, which summed up pretty much all my struggles also as a data engineer at the time. So I guess what led you to kind of write the sequel? Well, it's like what led me to write the original too. Um, so I think like trying to get back in the context at the time. So um, when I left Facebook to join Airbnb, so I think that was in 2014, um, internally they were still calling themselves, I think ETL people, like ETL engineer and business intelligence engineer. And I was like coming out of Facebook, I think we had started calling the team, the data engineering team. and. And to me, I changed the way, I came out of Facebook after two years, they're just thinking definitely about my role and about the industry and who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. Uh, and I wanted to make a chasm with the past, like just basically, I don't wanna use these GOE tools anymore. Um, I wanna do, uh, you know, pipelines as code, even, you know, just move away from the GUIs, be more, you know, bring some of the concept of software engineering into data processing, data engineering, um, serving people with data in, in general. And uh, and I think I wanted to make take a strong stance for that internally at Airbnb, even saying like, oh, we should, if we do job postings externally to go and hire people, we should, you know, put a job posting saying data engineer. But then people are like, what is a data engineer? You know, <laughs> and what does that mean? <clears throat> so I think I decided to to write the blog post. I think I had, writ I had read maybe and we should dig out that post but i think there was a similar post called the rise of the data scientist coming out of uh, someone internally at facebook yeah i see i see i see i didn't know that and, and, so so yeah which was similar similarly kind of declaring like hey there's a new role right. it's disruptive it's fun it's you know it's it's new and exciting so i wanted to do something similar for uh, for data engineering so that's where it came out of um and then you know I, th I think personally i was struggling with the role to where i wanted to go even further than you know being a data engineer and be more of a software engineer and a, and a tool builder um and then i was like oh here's what all the problems and the challenges around the roles are and maybe this is what we're going to need to break through to to make this kind of fun or and or successful or um 
or you know uh, this is the reason why I don't want to be a data engineer anymore maybe <laughs> you know mix of the, a mix a mix of the two and I think like you know the, we've done the return on that post so the, the it's called the downfall of the data engineer and then it's interesting to revisit it you know year after year uh, with practitioners too to see like is that is that still an issue yes or no because there's probably like five or six things in there that are like ah oh, this is why it sucks to um, to try to be influential in that role or to be successful in that role. Yeah, what, what was the reception like after, especially I guess after the downfall one? Like, do people were people like, oh my gosh, yes, like let's solve these problems, or what was that like? Yes, it's interesting. You know, like you, you you write a blog post. It's as if you walk into a microphone with an empty room and you say things, <laughs> and then uh, some people might mention it in, in a podcast five years later. You know, so that's the so the reception was not like oh there was like hundreds of people at my door the next day like ringing the doorbell, uh, trying to get interviews. <laughs> so. Uh, no, so I think, I mean, people reacted, there's, you know, if you think about like the people that read and review this stuff, so usually when you blog on, I don't know if, it, I don't, I think it was like my, it was not on behalf of a company, some blog posts I've written before was under like the, say, Airbnb or Lyft umbrella or, or preset, so it, get, it gets reviewed, it gets a little bit more, more attention and review internally, kind of just peer review, but on the peer review front, I think the I think people agreed generally, and I think it resonated overall. So over the years, I've heard people saying like, hey, I read the posts and really resonated with like similar to what you said. And then there's been a handful of times where we've done either podcasts or yeah, we did an article with Monte Carlo where we did the, the return on the downfall. Um, like, is that still an issue that we move, you know, move forward? And then for me, it's, it's it's never clear. Like, oh, is it you know, is it my experience as the, like how generalizable is this? Like, is it the same at all organizations? Like, anecdotally, maybe I talk to you know like thirty data engineers a year about these struggles, you know, here and there. But I guess it's hard to say like, oh, is that universal or is that you know limited to my experience? There, I remember there was a joke about like, oh yeah, you know, data science is data engineering until you have the data, like. I, so I know you got your start in like uh, like BI analytics and things like that. Like, have you thought about just at some point just you know giving up and just go do data science, which has like way more right like coverage and sort of support from leadership and things like that. Yeah, and I think it was called like the sexiest job in America uh -huh. for like five years. You know, so I was like, ah, that's like that sounds that sounds kind of good. Um, I, could, I could work on that. Join no, the but dark uh, <laughs> no, actually, not really. Um, and I don't know. I guess like the big difference was AI and ML, right? Like that was a really exciting thing, and that was the draw for a lot of people. And in retrospect, I think. It was and is, but like with generative AI now, I think a lot of the, you know, some of the skills learned in that era are, are I think, I think they're useful and transferable. But yeah, I, I think, I think like the draw for me was more um, software engineering in general than data science. I don't really know why. I think they, it, you know, maybe it's like. It's the the potential impact is seem like difficult to have like huge impact at this, as a data scientist, and then there's always like the, the data science. So people want wanted to go into it to do to solve problem using you know ML and AI, and then they were just kind of uh, data analysts that live in San Francisco wanted to call themselves data scientists because that's what company needs. Need. I mean that's an old joke. Yeah, right? That's yeah, like yeah. what is what is a data scientist? Oh, it's a data analyst living in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one before. No, but no, no. yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly, I think I'd say at Airbnb we had a data science team of like a hundred people at some point, and uh, and I think a lot of them were doing you know a, a lot of what data analysts would have done or what analyst engineers are doing today, um, either to support you know the kind of stuff they wanted to do in data science because like eighty percent of the work is the wrangling and the preparing of data, as you know, it's kind of well known. Or because it's what the company needed, and at some point, okay, there's a limited maybe number of problems you can uh, you can apply ML to. And if people want to work on like all creating creating models and doing that kind of stuff, there it seemed like there was a lot more impact to be had in terms of like doing very basic data science and applying it at scale. So that's more like data science engineering, um, you know, or, or data science infrastructure type stuff, which is different skill set. Yeah, I think over time almost every engineer or even data scientist at this point <clears throat> I've seen people move down below one stack 
Um, it's like, I've done enough mm -hmm. of that. Let me now build infrastructure for it, platformatize it, uh, if, if that is even a word, uh, to, to, to make mm -hmm. it easier for others to kind of just plug and play, for example. Like on the skill set thing, um, I always thought about like, okay, yeah, if you want to be a data scientist, you should like pick up the skill sets of the stack below you. So like data engineering skills. And then if you want to be a good data engineer, you need to pick up like the, like the stack below you. So like infrastructure, like data infrastructure, like skills. What do you think of that? Um, is that well, so, so yeah, I think if, yeah, a few things on that. So the first thing is like I th I th to see people expand or, or move lower down the stack over their career is like as a natural, a pretty natural progression, natural draw, where you become, you, as you solve the problem a certain layer, you want to go meta, like you want to go more, you know, generalize and say, oh, I want to solve the problem that creates the problem on, on the other layer. Like I want to get deeper, like solve it at a deeper level. So I think it's a natural, it's a natural progression. Uh, you know, I think expanding and become like widening your skills too is a, just in general is a natural progression. Um, is it better to go down the stack or up the stack? I think there's, there's different kind of biases there if you want to be closer to users and use cases in the business you know you can evolve in that direction if you want to get closer to the meta problem and how, how things are done uh, doing things in a more reproducible way like that's a normal draw too but I think overall if you think about just how people skills evolve like do you get deeper into a vertical or you get wider and then I would I would say like all of the paths are valid in terms as long as you gain surface right like you want to expand your surface either left or right you know or up the stack down the stack deeper in certain areas so you want to be a, a very like very very specialized very deep in an area or wider I think that's a that's a really interesting question overall I think my stance on that is better to go wide than go deep especially in the era of AI you know um, I think like. I think what we're gonna see with these LLMs and some some of the skills getting come out of commoditized, commoditized is um, it's better to be a generalist because then you have a bunch of little agents you could use eventually, right? And you have like very smart like it's as if you have an army of very smart uh, uh, interns, you know, for, uh, without like with some context, but like not a lot of good executive skill. At, at least like that's a way feeling uh, working with M, uh, with LMs feels like today so it's good to be to have good executive skills and coordinate coordination type skills uh, and then you can be wider and then get you know get help from different um, AIs to help you coordinate and build things and, and there's always the question the question of like is an AI gonna solve this for me so or can I if the AI is good at it maybe I don't need to learn it um, so speaking of like Gen AI, Gen AI, like, do you see like a kind of a parallel of like you know back in the days with data science, and then that was sort of getting a lot of the uh, coverage versus data engineering was sort of the um, kind of powering it, versus like today with Gen AI, like what do you reckon would be the equivalence of like data engineering? If oh, the effect, the, the effect of uh, say the the having this new tech on the role, you mean or? Well, so data, I think data science was, you know, an, imp an important thing that's transformative. Like what we're dealing with here, though, is like something that's changing, you know, everything and everyone and every role and every skill. So I think like, this is fundamentally different from anything we've seen before. Interesting. Okay. Right. Like it's, it can, can only be compared to like the Internet or something <laughs> like in terms of like the level of dis dis yeah. disruption and, and how it's going to affect everyone's life. And it's like one of these things. It's hard to see at what pace or what it's going to look like on the other side and how fast we're going to get there. Uh, but I, don't, I think, I think for, for me, I think one, one advice I, I give everyone is um, you should develop like first reflex to try to do it with AI or have AI do it for you. So the same way that we all develop, you know, first reflexes on, uh, on like, let me Google that around like 2000 to 2005. Uh, or as maybe as we get our first iPhones or our first smartphones, we're like, oh, we're having, you know, a debate about something. Or let me look that up, right? Like having that that first reflex. I think we need to develop that very very quickly with AI. Uh, so like, don't try to you know do it on your own. Try to do it with AI first, and if it sucks at it, then then do it on your own. 
What does that mean technically, or, or like uh, tactically? Would that be just like using ChatGPT try to solve the problem first, or like trying to come up with a prompt, or how? how... I, yeah, I mean, I think I think like if you look at your 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 daily your daily workflows and and I don't know what's on your to do list for today beyond say this podcast, but you can look at like okay, I've got these like some technical tasks, some things I'm trying to do before I even get started. I might try to ask my assistant and that's probably ChatGPT Claude um, and then to say like I'm just going to write down what I'm thinking about doing for that and see if I can get any or some assistance and then depending on it seems like this thing is going to be able to, to help you or not you can you know paste the right code snippets or input documentation or things you're trying to write whether you're trying to you know write an email or a message or a PR um, or design, you know, a data, a data model or something like that, like to write down your thoughts and work with your assistant on getting like the, the feedback loop without disturbing anyone is, is so glorious. And then you, you can figure out where it can and cannot help. But like that first reflex for most tasks, I think you should try to do it with assistance. I think from my, that's what I do. Like if you if were to look at my and and I definitely would not pull my chat GPT history <laughs> yeah. live on a podcast. It's a mix of everything. And and be cautious with privacy because like you know it does overflow to and like you know for me even for like founder advice or like legal input or everything the vast array of things that say a founder does as a at a startup. Um, I definitely have developed first reflex for most tasks. To ask, you know, ChatGPT and see how it can help. Mm. And um, it's it's good at things you would not think originally. It's it might be good at, right? That's a good analogy, because like you wouldn't also just pull up your Google history to be like, ha, you know, <laughs> oh, podcast. Yeah. So was, so. But what I was gonna say, the point around that is like the statistics of like how many times a day and the, the for for what kind of task I use this stuff is like I would say that it's like now it's like five to twelve prompts a day. Uh, or, or, or like miss sessions um, and, and across the variety of what it means to be a founder, you know, the kind of tasks that a founder might do. Even like yesterday, I had my um, immigration interview. I'm going to be an American citizen, so I'm Canadian originally. Mm-hmm. I've been on a green card for a lot. So, so I went and did the interview, but like I didn't know. Apparently, there's a hundred questions they might ask you and all that stuff. And I, I did like audio sessions with Chad GPT on a drive to the Bay Area this week. And I was like doing role play with it. It was asking me questions. I pra- By the time I got to the interview, I'd practiced the interview many times and reviewed, you know, what the three branches of the government are and uh, who's the current, you know, uh, security, secretary of states and all this stuff. All this stuff that were likely to ask me that were tricky. I'd reviewed and role play with GPT over audio in the car, which is like random use case, right? Um, that is pretty cool. But yeah, even like, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I was going to say like, even like for ideating, I'm like, oh, I feel like I, sh- I want to start a new open source project around like data access policy. Here's some ideas that I have and just having a conversation around, you know, instead of like writing in the void, uh, you're, you're kind of, you know, um, talking with someone smart that, ha- that has infinite time and attention for you until you run out of GPT-4, you know, a request for the day. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> oh. But uh, but it's, it's surprising how well it is that they're just being brainstorm, you know, uh, friend kind, kind of deal. And keep the emotions out of there. Like, not a friend, yeah. a useful assistant. Yeah. Oh. Think about that. Like, what is the most unusual thing you've asked chat gpt if you remember considering like for example the use case you just mentioned around brainstorming interview practice for american citizenship i would not have thought of that that is really cool yeah that's really good yeah. Uh, yeah, especially over voice yeah so when i say unusual i don't mean in a bad way but just like something which you didn't expect it to be good at but you were like oh this is really good at this thing too uh, i i think this the stuff i've been most amazed with is writing really um, intricate blog posts at, on the edge of discovery like what I what I think is kind of new like like let's say let's say like I, um, and, and ideating and brainstorming for around say uh, creation of new project I think it's extremely good at like marketing and product product marketing like messaging and positioning uh, for for startup founders it's something you might not think about if you're if you're not a founder but saying like hey we're trying we're coming up with this new this new product launch, you know, or we're thinking about a new product that we want to launch, you know, um, and here's how we want to position it and here's what we think it should do. Um, it's an extremely good 
product marketer. Uh, but I was going to say one thing I worked on recently, we could take the tangent eventually, is just think about semantic layers, uh, you know, in, in the BI world and, um, and then think about the intricacies of what exists and what the world needs. And uh, at some point, we did a hackathon project around um, what the ideal semantic layer might look like, you know, and its properties. And then just going back and forth. Some of, some of it's like the rubber duck effect, like just having someone to talk yeah. to yep. that that's just like bounces back ideas. So there's a lot of value in just having someone who listens carefully and spits back words that are related <laughs> to the, you know. But like even, yeah, so like, or can you, you know, um, give me some related ideas or I'm thinking of this thing or that, what, you know, what do you think? And, um, and it's been an extremely good partner to work on, on these things that call it the edge of like innovation and, and discovery. So some of the aspects you mentioned before was like, Hey, start with chat GBD first, similar to how we would go with, well, let's try to Google that first. Um, in a way you're saying it increases your productivity. Anything you're trying to do, it might already give you some aspect of the solution so you can do more as an engineer for example um now putting yourself in the founder seat how does it how do you think about um, your team size or hiring at that point because now you're saying what would have taken me x amount of time to do now with this co-pilot of sorts i can do a little more efficiently and so can your team um so have you thought about this in terms of like team size yeah i mean yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think as a founder, you always think about uh, throughput and productivity. And then how do we do more with overall and then how we do more with what we have. Uh, I think recently in the over the past year and a half, we're a lot more resource constrained than we were yes. before. Like before we were not, there was just no ceiling. Like you want to raise infinite money, take it. You want to have an infinite valuation, yeah. take it. Uh, I think now we've been really pushed to, to think about efficiency in general. I think it's always really hard to objectively measure throughput in software development, right? And so it's always hard to do estimates. It's always hard to, you could count lines of code, you can count PRs, you can count features, you can, uh, I don't know, you look at customer satisfaction. Uh, but I think, I think we're all a lot more productive than we used to be. Um, and one thing is for sure is like telling everyone in the company to build that first reflex of like, you know, well, first like, Everyone should have like pay for your, you know, we'll pick up the bill for your chat GPT or Claude or, you know, get the best AI you can or the one that you work best with, get um, Copilot, get all the tools, right? Um, if you need to produce some images, get mid journey, like just go, like that stuff is so cheap for what it does. Um, it's just a no brainer. So ena enabling people with it is it. Now in terms of like the, 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 the social economic, you know, changes over time is, Really, I mean, it's gonna have major impact. We just don't know exactly how, right? People are looking at like layoffs at FYI. I'm like, how many of these layoffs are, you know, related to AI or won't be replenished? Like that. Oh, uh, maybe it's just a normal dip and like markets go up and down. But the the swing back with AI might be very different this time around. Um, I think that's fundamentally true. Like in in general, if you look, like, does the printing press lead to like less? you know, text being written or read? No, right? Or is there less journalists because of the printing press, you know, or less writers? No, there's more, but I, this is this is different though. So as a founder, I can tell you, I think it's good to get the pulse on like the microcosm of like, oh, if you get the take on like how founders think about their, con uh, their companies individually, then maybe an aggregate that gives you a sense of what's gonna happen in the uh, more meta economic layer. But I would say, I think I think I think currently, yeah, I think it's you know startup is always where incentive incentivized to grow as much as possible. So uh, and now we're incentivized to be efficient. But uh, as you know, I double my my revenue. I probably want to double my effective my my expenses too, because we want to grow yeah. as fast as possible. Uh, so so there's clearly that, uh, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to start seeing like very, very small companies getting acquired for like we're going to see the less than 10 people unicorn becoming probably more and more of a thing in the future, too. So less people can accomplish as much in a lot of cases. Mm. I, I forget a thing I saw a tweet the other day. I forget who it was from, but it's like how many number of people does it take to build, let's say, a hundred million dollar company or a billion dollar company, for example. And that number keeps going down with 
advances with what we're seeing with LLMs, for example, and it might eventually come down to maybe one person a company and that is still valued at this um, higher number, for example. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably being been the, the trend overall, just productivity going up, but there's, there's a big kind of step change yeah. happening and then just a lot of things are going to be different on the other side. Yeah, and as I said, it's unclear like what it's going to look like during the transition, how fast the transition is going to go, and yeah, where we're going to land. Uh, so on the topic of uh, LLMs, and there are a bunch of other things you can also talk about. Um, you have this open source project, Promptimize. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so I mean that was a that was a I think uh, got it like a year ago or so. We were building. Um, text to SQL features inside Superset as a differentiator for presets. So for context, people are not super familiar with uh, with what I do. I started Apache Superset after I started Apache Airflow and been really dedicated to Apache Superset and then started a company, it's a commercial open source company where we offer Superset um, as a service essentially, right? And then Su Superset is an open source competitor to the Tableau and Looker, uh, Lookers of the world. So a BI tool. And it's fully open source. It's amazing. It works super well. There's no reason why people should pay for <laughs> vendors, you know? And then if you want a hosted solution around it, well, so if you haven't checked it out, you can check it out. Um, just go to Apache Superset um, and you can check out, you know, uh, what it does, what it is. And you can play it, you know, you, you can get set up quickly, use it, yeah. try it. Um, and then preset is just a cloud service around it with some bells and whistles and some improvements, some of some of which, and I won't go into like the exact pitch of uh, just in the context of what we're talking about. Um, so we built a, an AI assistant within uh, preset to augment superset, and that's a differentiator because we need to you know make money <laughs> and uh, have a commercial offering as well, right? On top of the cloud service. So we were working on like text to SQL. And, uh, and it's a tough, it's a tough problem, and it's really hard to work with. Well, it's really deceptively easy to work with these LLMs. You, you work with it. You're like, hey, here's a few table schema. Can you write SQL that does this? You're like, oh my god, this thing is good at SQL, <laughs> which has deep implication for uh, the data engineering world that we haven't talked about. But like, you know, being a SQL monkey is probably not going to cut it anymore when AI is a, is a better SQL monkey mm -hmm. than than we are. The, the thing it's lacking is the executive skill and the, the memory, right? The long term memory and the, and the business context that are for now private from the LLM and need to be squeezed into a context window for it to, to make sense and be useful. So we started working on this problem saying like, oh my God, like this thing is so good at writing SQL if you provide it the right context. So started looking at you know vector databases to store your data models um, and, and just in, in general, like working you know, on the ch some of the challenges we hit like early on, we're like working with different SQL dialects, making sure, you know, that the, the AI is able to generate the right dialect. It gets a little confused around that. Um, <clears throat> and then providing just overall the, the right context as to what you're trying to do and, and what the models it can use are. And when we started working on that, like what we realized is, you know, you can use uh, GPT-3.5 Turbo, or GPT-3.5, or GPT-4, yeah. and you can bold something in your prompt that says, like, do not, you know, cap make sure to capitalize, you know, the reserve words, or, or if it's BigQuery, do this, right? So you can, you can start, like, just really changing your prompt, and then it changes the outcome really intricately. And then what we're trying to solve is the big, big fuzzy problem of like people might ask anything and your data schema might look like anything. Mm -hmm. So how do we measure the quality of our prompt or the quality or, you know, whether just even something as simple as should we use three, five turbo or four turbo or a four or right. And how much better is it performing? So, so early on, we found um, this uh, decent or good data, data set around text to SQL is called a spider data set. It's out of people. I forgot if it's like MIT or sorry, I, I don't want to miss quotes. I'm not going to say anybody. You can research like there's a spider data set. That's a list of prompts, sample schemas, and then the good answers for it. And there's a bit of a context where people are like, oh, you know, we did different teams work on this problem. I say, oh, we did 82% or we did like 87% with chat GPT um, on this test set. So it's a published test set. And then there was no way at the time to just um, write kind of unit tests or a framework for 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 someone to take um, 
unit tests and measure the outcome. And so Promptimize, the, the idea behind it was like, oh, let me write a little toolkit where you can write your your prompt cases, which I like to test mm -hmm. cases for, if you're, if you're familiar with, take some of the ideas from like unit testing frameworks and apply them to prompt engineering and prompt testing. Hmm. Uh, so that we could say like, okay, take this 2000 tests and run them against GPT-3.5 or it takes, you know, run in G against GPT-4 Turbo and compare the output of like the percentage of success where one succeed over the other, what it's good at, what it's bad at, um, how much it costs, how long it takes, like the average, uh, the P90 of how long it takes for the prompt to, to come back. So wanted to apply the scientific method and just rigor to prompt engineering. And, and that's, you know, prompt is a little toolkit to allow you to, to do that with, with some amount of structure. It, it's quite cool. And um, I saw that you guys also have like link chain support. And for me also for lane chain, it was like when I first like started looking at it, I guess this is like last year. I was like, why do you need a library to do this? Don't I just like <laughs> write these texts and then it just sort of like works. And then I think, right, like as more I started trying to like write better prompt and, you know, do more use cases. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's such a mess. Like without sort of these mm -hmm. like libraries and I think it's the exact same thing with the Promptimize, right? Where it's... Um, like once things get to kind of the production level where like it's actually dollars on the line, like this, like you actually want like the same engineering sort of like the best practice that we've developed, right? To actually have that transferred mm -hmm. over, uh, transferred over instead of just kind of putting your hands in the air. Yes, it's like trying to have some empirical measurement in a very fuzzy, unknown world, right? And then, cause yeah. like you're, you're working on your prompts and you can add like literally a hint in there to say like, oh, please, but please don't do this. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you look at your 10% of failure, say on text to SQL generation, and you might, might realize like, oh, all the failure are related to trying to run that stuff on Snowflake because it, it's not good at speaking uh, the Snowflake dialect. So then you might add a thing that says, Oh, well, but if you're using Snowflake and specifically date date function to change the, the, the date grain of a thing, make, you know, here's some function definition that you can use, right? Or like be cautious around this. But then you're like, by doing this, you might have like whack-a-mole there, but then more like, you know, might have made right. some like right, right, the right. BigQuery support worse, right? Exactly. So then it's really hard to know this. So you need empirical, you know, you need more rigor around that. And that was like the general idea with Promptimize. On Langchain, I think it's really interesting because like when I found it, I had the same thing. I like, I don't really understand <laughs> why this exists. Not because I, I just didn't understand the problem space. Then I got familiar with the problem space. I was like, oh yeah, this is like everything I need. This is super great. But then I started to try to use it, and then I was like, and and no disrespect or anything for the toolkit. I think it's just something that matured very quickly. But then I started using it. And I was like, oh, this is it does like kind of what I wanted to do, <laughs> but then it not, but but not exactly. And then I cannot use the, the methods that are here exactly in the way I want to use them. So then you kind of fall off, or you know, for for me, I was like, ah, oh, it's harder to try to bend this toolkit into submission than the value I get from it, you know, in, in some ways, right? So it has a lot of convenience method to say, break text right. into chunks and uh, it, with some amount of overlap do this and that. So some things are really useful, but then I think say it didn't have support for the particular vector database we wanted to use at the time or not the kind of support that we needed. So then you, you went like 80% of the way, but then you have to monkey patch some stuff to make it work. So, so they're like, that's oh, just like a little bit of Python that does some text processing. Like I can, I can, we can write that with AI in like five minutes, it's easier. <laughs> Interesting. So, so is that what you guys internally do? Is just kind of like having your own sort of set of like utils and stuff to help this stuff? <laughs> that, I think I think we I think we do use uh, some like just a so land chain is a is a weird it's not it's a toolkit you know so you can kind of think of it like a you know as a bunch of like utility tools around right. AI and ML and I think like over time I think we grew to using like just specific portion of the toolkit it's like oh we use the hammer and a, and a screwdriver but we don't use like anything that saws or cuts or you know so 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 we we pick some part of it i think stuck around and some things are like okay we could we'll just do our own thing because it's harder to bend this tool into doing what we do we need to do than it is to just do it on our own for for some use cases and so like 
internally or some of like what I'm trying to work on is like a lot of like summarization and then trying to like kind of almost like style transfer for like text. And I remember it's been kind of a learning journey because um, at first I was just like trying things and then it just like doesn't work. And I was like, man, this LLM thing, man, it's all hype. <laughs> like shit doesn't work. <laughs> and then it took me a while to realize it's like, okay, I'm actually just really bad at prompting. Um, it's kind of like, like Googling back in the days, right? Like if you don't like sort of do the right keywords, it's kind of like the result is not like super great. Um, so do you have like, and I guess so for you, right? Like, you know, you're doing like eight to 10 prompts every day. Like, did you see that gradual like improvement in terms of uh, results for yourself? And like, how do, how do I get better at this? Like I do want yeah. to get better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's like you have to approach it a little bit more like a, a fuzzy, like, you know, um, like a human maybe like it maybe it's like oh you approach someone you don't know very much that you know they've maybe they're they're high uh, graduate that you know you know they're smart and they have accumulated a lot of knowledge in different areas right so but then you you don't know how to work with them and you don't know how good they might be about, about at different things so i don't think i don't think the answer is to over engineer your prompts too so it's just like what do I need to tell it for it to help me, you know? And then in some cases, like, I think I've gotten more sloppy with the way I interact with GPT too. In, gener in some areas, right? Like in some areas you're like, I can just like, like I'll take like something, I'll just open a session and take, if I'm doing some coding, I might have just an error message or a, you know, a, a problem in CI, I'll just like copy paste a big thing instead of text and just throw away i didn't see what it's gonna say it might have some good pointers you know um i think fundamentally the first thing is like oh well what context does it need to help me and what context does it have from you know um learning from the entire internet so so you have to say okay it doesn't know anything about things that's specific to my business or my use case or, right so what's not generalizable What's it going to need? And then, you know, you, you, you can certainly try more things. Like, what if I tell you this? That can you help me more? And um, so, so it's progressive disclosures until you prove or disprove whether they're going to, you know, it's going to be able to help you or not. But yeah, in terms of like, you know, I think text to SQL and Promptimize, I think what I realized, like a lot of the use cases for AI, I think are, are not as empirical or as measurable as the one we have. In some ways, we're blessed with text to SQL because if I ask you, can you write this query on, on this database? Um, it's pretty much, I mean, it's not always like, a, you know, a hundred percent like a Boolean on like whether it succeeded or not. Now, sometimes it might like, I don't know, put uh, re alias columns in a weird way or giving you more than what you ask for, but it's useful, right? So, so it's sometimes it's so it's not a pure bull, you know, like correct, not correct, but at least we have something that's like generally we could say this is a good answer, this is a bad answer. If you say, Can you please summarize this text in a paragraph? It's harder to, to evaluate whether it succeeded or not, right? Or if you have a CS type, uh, customer success type question, you're writing a CS bot, which is a huge family of use cases, right? People want to automate support. Um, so if I have, a, if I, I can simulate and optimize a, a chat session where someone, you know, put some information, I, I need help with this and that, uh, but it's harder to read the answer and give it a score so that then you can use an AI to do that. But then you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, that, I, I, I don't know. I was like, what are you doing? That could be a problem of like garbage in, garbage out, but uh, you have to yeah. trust the underlying system beyond a point. Well, it's, oh, it's like a circular thing. Like if you get the AI to evaluate the answer of the AI, like then you need to, ev you know, to evaluate the answer of the answer of the AI to make sure it help you. But, but I mean, you, but you could, I, I think you can, you can, and then I talk with some people that use Promptimize in more fuzzy use cases that are less like this Boolean, like it's the AI succeeded, yes or no. Um, for instance, I think the examples that are really interesting in, in the Promptimize examples that I wrote when I originally um, wrote the project, there was like writing some Python functions. I, I can actually ask the AI to write a Python function, take the Python function, and then run, run unit tests on it and make sure it actually works. So it's like write a function that, you know, does the tells you if it's a prime number or not, then it generates a code, then you actually put it in an interpreter and, and test it. So that this uh, empirical use cases. But yeah, when you get to like less empirical, like 
true or false use cases it gets more subjective and and hard to evaluate but this is pretty cool like this is more like test driven development right you specify what yeah. you want you describe the tests but you let the and then you evaluate whether the code you got back is actually doing what you asked for it to, you asked it to do um would be a good... yeah the blog post was very much like originally when i wrote the thing it was like bring the bring the tdd and like you know uh rigor and what we've learned in software engineering you know tests devil like you know unit tests yeah. tester and development to prompt to prompt engineering uh, well the project is super cool and we'll definitely link it in our show notes uh we, we recommend people check it out not just the project but also uh preset superset and airflow uh Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and learn more about us at softwaremisadventures.com. You can also write to us at hello at softwaremisadventures.com. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, take care.